Hello, everybody. Welcome to TJK Shares. One-on-one -on -one with TJK. This is another beautiful day God has given us. We praise and thank him for the day. As we promised you, every week we bring you extraordinary people doing amazing things around the world in so many different fields. Today, I am so excited and happy to be hosting my sister. We have had so many conversations, ladies and gentlemen. We have known each other for so long, but we've never met in person. So here we are meeting again <laughs> via technology. We thank God for technology. We thank God for everything he enables us to do. This channel is a place where you learn, unlearn, and relearn. We come together as a community to share free knowledge. And so today, my sister, Razai, joins mm -hmm. me all the way from Soloti. Welcome, my sister, and thank you for joining us. Well, thank you so much, uh, Jackson, for having me on your show uh, tonight or on this episode it's really an honor to be hosted by you and to interact with you on this level which is for me uh, a professional feeling you know uh, interacting with you on this level on a show it's uh, technical and i'm going to be careful with what oh, no, i say no, so no. thank you so much. please <laughs> be as open as you are we are friends for a long time you've hosted me in so many different interviews this is not an interview, it is a conversation. So please tell us just a little bit about yourself. Razia Athman is my name, and many people normally ask, uh, where is Razia from, where is Athman from? Yes. And many people address me as uh, a he or Mr. Athman. And I have to labor to explain that, oh, Athman is my dad's name, it's not my first name. So my first name is Razia. Not actually Atman. I had to clarify that. But I'm, a, you know, a Ugandan. Uh, I can describe myself as someone who is uh, ambitious. I'm a journalist, I'm a resilient journalist, and I am a creator of things. I've created a couple of things in my job as a journalist and also outside uh, the newsroom with Uganda Reading, which we'll talk about later. I'm also a mom, not a very new mom. I'm a mom of one. Yes. And I love the idea of being an avid reader, which is something I'm still working on with my movement. And I normally look out to inspire one or two people with, with whatever work that I do. That's who I am. That's who you are in the summary. Tell us about where you grew up, uh, your areas, since people refer you as a he, but you are a she, how come your parents gave you those names? And who influenced you and shaped the person you've become in your areas? So I spent uh, my earliest years, childhood, in Kenya. I okay. stayed a lot with my uh, grandmother and with my father. My father was a pilot. He's a retired pilot. So... Many times could be flying all over the world while I was staying with my grandma and mom. That's mm. in Kenya. So I have a lot of uh, Swahili accent if you <laughs> hear the way I speak. And many people ask me whether I'm Kenyan. I'm not Kenyan, I'm Ugandan. But yes. I've stayed a lot uh, <laughs> in Kenya in my early uh, childhood. So my primary school started in Kenya, uh, secondary school. I was in Uganda and university, uh, Uganda as well. And the kind of people I grew up with, you know, through this uh, switching, you know, holiday or dad around, uh, sometimes he's not around because of his job. Uh, these are people who were really into, first of all, the standard traditional African upbringing, um, how a child behaves, for example, when there's a visitor in the house, how a child behaves when uh, the mom or the dad comes back home how a child behaves when they are, you know, growing up at about eight years old. What can you do at eight years old? Can you wash your clothes? 
Yes. Can you help with chopping onions in the kitchen? Can you make sure you lay your bed when you wake up in the morning? So these were very uh, strict environments where you had to follow very, very strict rules. It wasn't uh, all freedom all the time. If you're playing outside, how long are you playing? What time are you getting back in the house? And then being also a Muslim family, so we also had uh, mandatory prayers. It had to be five times. You'd be woken up uh, very early in the morning at 6 a.m. for the first uh, prayer, and it's called Subuhi. We wouldn't miss that. And even if you were aged uh, 12 years, they would make sure at least you wake up every morning for that. So there's this uh, kind of uh, structure that I got used to uh, because of, you know, uh, the way I was uh, brought up. You know, uh, you're supposed to wake up in the morning and pray. You're supposed to believe in, you know, God. You're supposed to welcome visitors like this. You're supposed to be helpful around the house. Even when you're visiting, you cannot just go to someone's house and sit there and, 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 and enjoy everything that you've been, you're being served. You have to do at least one or two things. You cannot just sit. You cannot uh, let someone who is older than you do something for you. If they were sending someone maybe to you know handle a car at home, it would be you, the youngest person. So these are some of uh, the values that I was brought up uh, in. That is from Kenya and, and to Uganda. And it's really how we grew up. So by the time we came to uh, Uganda, my dad was now working here at uh, Soroti uh, Flying School as a flight instructor. Yeah. He had retired from uh, flying in Kenya and he was now here in Soroti. And we still continued uh, with that very uh, culture. You're praying, you're believing in something you don't see. You believe in Allah and what's ordained, what's meant for you. You believe in, you know, respecting others and respecting yourself. That's why uh, many times you'd see me, and sometimes I do it, I'm always veiling because of how we were taught. How much are you revealing, for example, as a lady? How are you carrying yourself out there as a lady, as a Muslim lady? So these are things that really uh, have shaped who I am today and my personality. And I'm glad you brought up veiling and the culture, the Muslim prayers, and how, how your dad raised you and you used the mm -hmm. word we so we are going to go back and ask who are the siblings who are the we but i want to re-emphasize that on tjk shares we have not actually interviewed a muslim woman i've interviewed an indian woman who explained how indian culture embraces that so we are going to go mm -hmm. back there because this interview is being done while I'm in the United States of America. We are in the middle of war between Israel and Palestinians and Hamas and everything that goes on. And when 9-11 happened, Razia, I was here in the United States. And people developed a stereotype towards Muslims, men and women. That point is coming back because I want you to enlighten the humanity of people and respect for our cultures and our religions, regardless what it is, and raise awareness about it. Tell us about your siblings. Who, who are the we? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, there's uh, nine other uh, siblings. Um, of course, uh, five, five of them Five, five, five of them are older than me, so they they, they are they are above me, and and, and then I have uh, three siblings, uh, no four, yeah, four siblings uh, after me. So the way we grew up, so some of them at one point, uh, some of them you know preferred to remain in Kenya, mm. others uh, like me myself. It was actually just me and another brother of mine, uh, someone who followed me. So, yeah came to Uganda, the rest <laughs> remained in Kenya remained for most of their, Kenya. you know, school life. Uh, but as we speak, you know, uh, we are all uh, all over the world. Uh, some people are in Nairobi, in Tanzania, in Germany, in Canada. So everyone is, uh, I guess, leading their own lives. And of course, uh, we, we came out to be uh, different people in as far as careers are concerned. I'm the only journalist <laughs> in the family. But we also have a psychiatrist. Uh, we have an um, I software developers. In fact, those we have three. Uh, we have a, a farmer, a professional farmer. We 
we have um, uh, we have a, a, a stylist. So yeah, you have everything. <laughs> so that's it. And and growing up, we had also some kind of uh, cliques. So there's uh, us who were very noisy. We'd be locked up in one room if we were making uh, a lot of noise. I mean, one person would be locked in one room, another person mm -hmm. in another room. And that's my sister. She's called Majuma. Uh, my dad never let us stay in a, a one room in the night. would make a lot of noise. So his uh, very mm -hmm. simple punishment was to make sure we're in separate rooms <laughs> at any given time in the night. So those those are my siblings, really. Uh, one thing that we are um, uh, similar about, I guess, is the faith. It's the faith, uh, the things we believe in, uh, hard work. Uh, we believe in, as I said earlier, what's meant to be will be. We believe in uh, guidance from the, should I say, should I call it spiritual world? So yes. We, we, yeah, because we're brought up uh, Allah. in a in a faithful kind of environment, you know, exactly. you never know. You say you're going to Soroti for holidays, but you, it's, uh, if Allah wills, you'll be there. So you have to say, if Allah wills, we'll be there. Yeah, so that's who so, we are. But we've also maintained a very close, uh, should I say, um, should I say network? Yes. Mm -hmm. Like most of us are here. We just arrived today in Soroti. Oh, the holidays, uh, people are married and what, but we make time. Thank you, Come and thank you for time. thank you for what? sparing <laughs> time. Thank yeah. you for sparing time while you are on family holiday, which is why we we want to make it as short and sweet. So you are mm -hmm. done as a pilot, and you ended up becoming a journalist. Mm -hmm. uh, who influenced you, or how did you choose that line of career to become a journalist and influence? interested in the media so i'll never forget when we were young and someone would ask me what would you want to become i would say a lawyer mm. uh, that's in primary school most of my primary school i think i used to say i want to become a lawyer but there are some uh, areas of mm. uh, the legal practice that are actually prohibited in islam yes. uh, for example criminal law and it's very difficult to discern and to tell uh, who are you, you know, standing for as a lawyer? Because there's always a guilty part, which is why it's a career that is to an extent limited when it comes to Islam. You can't practice it perfectly yes. because you're going to take a side and you're going to, you know, sometimes force uh, a case onto someone because you, you're caring about who your client winning the case. So yeah. I think that's how I got... I started forgetting about that dream because they would tell me, oh, no, this, uh, this is not a good career for, for a Muslim. You, you need to pick something else. Okay. So um, from primary school going to Form 1, uh, Senior 1, I went into uh, music, dance, and drama. And I'll do a lot of uh, performances at school. And it's not something, again, that my dad was very, very proud of. Mm -hmm. But I think I what I found was a kind of uh, shortcut because the idea was to be able to, you know, stand in front of people and present something, stand in front of uh, masses of people and do something, get people to sit down and listen. If I'm not singing, what else would I be doing that would put me on that spot? Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, I could try uh, this thing called uh, journalism. And I started practicing journalism by you know, trying to write stories, trying to write books, trying to write uh, maybe newscasts in high school. And uh, eventually, by the time I was in my senior fall vacation, I'd already started uh, doing some radio. And I, I used to do radio in Kenya because it was mandatory for us to go to Kenya. From Uganda, it was mandatory for us to go to Kenya for holidays, spend some time with our grandma. Mm. And in my senior fall vacation, I got an opportunity to start a work as a radio presenter and a writer. I was a very little girl. And uh, from there, even when I went to senior six, uh, I mean, senior five and senior six, it was easy for me to be part of the communications team, the information, um, what, what was it called then? In school, it's not guild. Huh? But they, ha they they have these people who are in charge of communication in high school. Well, I forget yes, the name. Yes. But I was part Prefect. of that. 
Great and also still did. Yes. I was a prefect of information and entertainment once uh, in my senior five. And I did also still a, a little bit of uh, entertainment, uh, things to do with uh, public uh, mass communication and entertainment, things along uh, those lines. I did a lot of that. Then I was the Minister for Information and uh, Public Relations. And uh, with that position in the Guild, I had the opportunity of coming up with a news magazine. And that was at Kampala International uh, University, where we had uh, something called The Giraffe. Giraffe was a weekly uh, publication for the university. Mm -hmm. uh, all the reporters in there, the writers, were university students, and we also had uh, the opportunity of working at the university's uh, radio station to do a little bit of, you know, training. And I, I, I didn't mention in my six, senior six uh, vacation. So my dad used to sponsor me to go and work at a radio station that never paid me even a single coin. <laughs> but for so many months, he would give me transport and. Uh, Sometimes uh, money for lunch if I had to spend more time <laughs> at the radio station yeah. to do this work. And that was in my senior six uh, vacation. And it's that experience that I covered to the university. And I continued with information and public relations in the, in the guild. Even when I wasn't um, a, a representative, I was still so much uh, into uh, information and communication. I did start my own peer company. I traveled around East Africa. <laughs> to do visibility studies to see where I can set up uh, my company for PR and all this was, was sponsored uh, by my dad he just tried to I guess keep me busy and, and maybe letting me find uh, my standing and footing in this uh, industry called uh, media and communication yes. and also while at university the internship I started working at a radio station in Kampala I, I, I did some reporting uh, for, you know, a couple of radio stations from parliament, from court. So I got the basics, really, of of, of reporting, being a journalist. Yes. But later, there was an opportunity when Urban Television was looking for a presenter. So they were carrying out a ta talent search. And they were looking for, you know, the best presenter. And the thousands of us uh, turned up for this because many people are looking for jobs at any given time. Exactly. Uh, that... That contest ran for, I think, six months, from the end of 2011 to somewhere uh, mid-2012. mid, mid uh, 2012. I think by April, yes, I think the winners, the winners were awarded by April or May. I don't remember, but the year was 2012. Yes. And I was among the, the top 10 uh, selected from the 2,000-plus contestants. And and that's how I got my footing at at Urban TV at Vision Group, yeah. where I had worked uh, since then. You know, 2011, 2012, uh, to 2017, and then I and and, and between 2011 and 2017, I started doing a lot of uh, international uh, correspondence. So yeah. I correspond for TRT World, uh, the BBC. Uh, I did some work for Al Jazeera and then I got uh, the opportunity of working for African News at their own bureau in, in Congo, in Pondo, where I did work for uh, four years and when the bureau closed there, I came back and still came back home, which is uh, at <laughs> Urban TV at yes. Vision Group and and that's pretty much my journalism career. So I, do, I still do a lot of uh, international uh, work. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I do produce and make films, not just for international media houses, but also NGOs and organizations. Yeah. So you uh, you worked with Robert Kavshenga, uh, when, yes. when he, you know, our, our mutual friend. You, yes. in, in short, we can call it married media expert. You've, you've mm -hmm. done it, but within that, between moderating panels, interviewing political figures, writing pieces for uh, TV, print. You also started 
I, I don't want to call it a channel. You started an organization called Uganda Reading. And in fact, that's how we got connected. As an author, uh, published mm -hmm. author, my book somehow finds somewhere itself. And you put a group of people together to begin Uganda Reading. Please share with our listeners what inspired you in a culture that does not read so much, we will still have a long way to go. Why did you start Uganda Reading? What was the inspiration behind it? I think it's interesting that our literacy level uh, as Uganda is very high, according to the World Bank, at least 70%. So 70% yeah. of 45 million people can read and can write. Yeah, but, but what we are, are we reading? Razia, they are measuring people who have gone from primary school to finishing. They are not measuring after you finish your books. Have you picked up a novel? What do you read? Mm -hmm. And even if you want to take it even further, if you look at how many people grab a newspaper and just jump to the sports section, look which European team won and close and drop it down. So let's not go deeper into it. Yes, so your inspiration, World Bank has us, has us Ugandans higher. So you yeah. please start. I mentioned it. I mentioned it because I'm one of those uh, many Ugandans who, after school, I many if I'm not reading for school, I'm hardly reading anything. So I read as an obligation because I have to read through a book for an assignment. Or I have to read through a book for an exam, I have to revise my books, maybe in primary school, in secondary. I have to read all these uh, literature books, novels and poems uh, because of an exam that's coming up. And after that, I, I, I'm just not reading. Yet I can read. I have the ability to read. I have the ability to even write. I could even write my own books, but I'm not doing it. I'm not feeling inspired enough. And I thought that was uh, a problem, not just for me, but for many Ugandans. And the uh, initial inspiration or the initial motive behind starting Uganda Reading was to encourage me myself. I needed to set some challenges or targets for myself mm. and then put myself out there in public and say, hey, I want to read uh, one book in one month. So it's kind of, uh, you will be uh, checking me. Have I been able to read this book? So I, it is, I created a a sort of accountability. So after the end of the month, I come back to you and say, I've been able to read this book. This is what I picked from it. Uh, this is what I think about the writer. This is what I think about the content of this book. Do a book review of sorts. Exactly. And like that, I was able to, you know, together with a few friends of mine, come up with a book club. The book club was very small. From that book club then was born uh, Uganda Reading. So it wasn't just about me and a few of my friends, it became something about let's encourage Ugandans to read. Let's encourage a strong reading culture in the country and across Africa. And how is it going now? I must admit we have been a little bit um, inactive. That's the word I can use. Mm -hmm. I think since uh, COVID-19, uh, so many things uh, change. And as Uganda reading is true, we've gotten stuck in the transition, you know, how do we maintain our reading our concepts, our reading programs across all these uh, places without being able to interact uh, physically? I think that's where we got stuck. And especially because I was also away. Yes. So it became a little bit difficult to continue with that um with a program, I would call it a program because we run programs at the uh, prisons, we run programs in hotels, we run programs in schools, we run programs in markets and we run programs in hospitals. But uh, it's been, I think, two years. We haven't really done something specific uh, to Uganda reading. Although we try and keep these programs active, we make sure people are reading, but we haven't been there physically and in a dedicated manner to say we've curated this uh, concept, 
and we want to be able to read uh, this book maybe in one week or we are doing a book donation drive in, in a month for a certain uh, primary school. We haven't been able to do that in two years. Yeah, but the spirit lives on. And we're still sharing a lot in terms of uh, reading and encouraging us as members. We are online and we are active online. We are active on uh, our platforms, on uh, our WhatsApp group. We're still active. We're still, you know, sharing uh, matters, reading and writing. So the spirit is on and the mission is still on. Our objectives are still very clear. And, I, um, and hopefully we'll be able to resume. I know that Uganda Prisons recently invited us to revive an active uh, Uganda Reading Club. And we should be able to do that uh, early 2024. And uh, while I ask you that question, I'm also part of the Uganda Reading Organization. Yes. Uh, recently, actually a week ago, I was in Uganda. And at a meeting with a new ambassador, American ambassador, we were able to meet with the uh, head of USID and there is a, a push to get books, children books that are published in English, but also translated in local languages. And I did tell them I would donate my five children books to be translated in different languages so they can distribute them to as many students as possible. So that's something mm -hmm. we can Tackle and follow up of the interview here. Uh, yes, exactly. Uh, Uganda reading, and we we can do it through Uganda reading program. I don't. Yes, uh, yeah, well, that uh, sounds exciting, and I think we need a huge, we need a huge. Um, I want. I don't call it activity. We we need a task. We need a huge task like that, <laughs> so it can keep us busy as well, and uh, it still helps in you know putting us in that path to the mission and objective of building a strong reading culture in Uganda and across Africa. Exactly. Recently, I had a conversation with Maseki Nobuisho of URBS, and I was asking her a question about how she balances different roles in her life. And she introduced the concept of buckets. You are dealing with different buckets, Razia. You have a child, you are a mother, you are a journalist, you are a daughter, you are uh, an older sibling, you are a younger sibling. All this put together with your journalism career, how do you go around taking care of all these buckets and still smile? That's a tough question, eh? <laughs> a tough question. Yes. It's a How tough question. But I think, uh, first of all, I think I have a drive. Okay. I have a drive. So whatever I do, I don't feel like I'm forced to do it. Okay. And because I don't feel like I'm forced to do this, I'm going to make time for it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to make time for for whatever I'm doing, whether it's motherhood, whether it's uh, going up country or traveling outside Uganda to cover a story, whether it's, you know, taking part in an activity, Uganda reading activity, whether it's uh, being in class, uh, I'm, I'm just going to make, first of all, time for it. Yes. Already I have the motivation bit. No one is forcing me to do it. I'm motivated to do it. Uh, I don't need someone to push me to do this. So I'm going to make time for it. I think that's one of the things I do to be able to balance all the things. I make time for all these aspects in my life. I make time for my family. I make time for my son. I make time for being a mother. You know, you can have a son, but <laughs> being a mother, I guess, is a different role. <laughs> so I make time for my work, for my journalism. I make time for my travels because... I'm a journalist at Urban TV at Vision Group, but I'm also traveling a lot, producing a lot of content for all these international media organizations. So I make time for all these uh, aspects. And once you make time for all these aspects, you know, on a given day, uh, the things, the little things, these are like small goals that you need to meet. You know, today, 
uh, what's on my, you know, calendar, what's on my schedule. At this time, I'm doing this. At this time, I'm doing that. At this time, I'm doing that. At this time, I'm doing that. So managing your time, I guess, is very important. It's mm -hmm. something I do all the time. Every single day, I know uh, what I'm supposed to accomplish. And some days, I may not accomplish everything in all my aspects. Maybe some days I'll be more of a mother <laughs> than a journalist. Maybe some days I'll be more of a, a sister than, yeah. uh, than a mother. Maybe some days, depending on uh, the priorities on that day. But the important thing of being able to balance is to recognize all these aspects and make time for them. Mm -hmm. Then you can, you can achieve it all, I believe. Because if you don't make time for them, you're bound to get overwhelmed and you get lost in all this uh, confusion and uh, all these things come with a lot of pressure and it's very easy to you know succumb to all these uh, pressures so once you understand the motivations you understand the importance of you know managing your time then it becomes easy for you to uh, departmentalize you know and say i have this i have that i have that how do i achieve all this how much time am i giving this on this day and to have all that so it's that, motivation and that, passion, managing time and deciding intentionality, deciding that I'm going to do this. I need to achieve this from this today. This is what my day looks like. So you go out there and you know exactly what you need to achieve. I, I didn't I didn't mention this. I'm a marathoner, yeah. So I love, I love, I love running. That's really part of me. I didn't mention it in who I am. So I'm I into was, sport. I was actually a coming to that. <laughs> In addition, yeah, so I also make time for that because if I'm running a marathon, I need six hours, maybe plus, you know, I'm to organize, to run, rest, and to you know, refresh and everything. So I also give a lot of time to my sport. I think I started running marathons before you did. Uh, mm? then I started running marathons, I ran three and stopped New York Marathon. Yeah. Yes, I stopped. I now run half, 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 half. Uh, to try. <laughs> I want my body to go into the 90s, still be able to run rather than start cracking. Yes, finishing all of How many have you run? Uh, so far, I've done, I think, uh, four, four, five marathons. But I do a lot of long distance. So many times I'll do 38 kilometers, which is just <laughs> very short of a marathon. 35 kilometers, very short of a marathon. 30 kilometers, very short of a marathon. But a full marathon, I've done five. Five uh, or six. Maybe. Is this something yeah. you've always done? Is this something you picked up recently? This you have. No. I've always been a runner. I started running in uh, 2000 and, uh, 2006, 2007, 2007. Huh? 2007, I started long distance running, running 10 kilometers. Okay. That's when I started long distance. So I'd been doing 10, 10, 10, 15, 15, 20, 20. Then uh, I went into, I started running marathons in 2021. Okay. Yeah, 2021. And I've been doing two, 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 two. So, yeah. So each two, year. Two, two. Yeah. Oh, my. But next year I'm doing three marathons. So. Wow. Okay, ready for that. you run mine yeah. and run your two. I, I, I'll pass mine. Do you ever want to run a New York Marathon? Yes. The organization I lead has had an opportunity to partner with New York Marathon, and we are continuing to look for a Ugandan who can come and run a New York, New York Marathon for Nyaka. So sign up, <laughs> and we can get that done in November. Okay. Good. So that. when we think about what you've already accomplished and where you are going, what does the future look like for you? What's next in the next bucket? Next bucket. Yes. In my career, I think since school, eh? so I, I have this teacher in me. I behave like a teacher, by the way. In yeah. my work, even at school, I would be this person who would help the teacher explain <laughs> whatever is not being understood. 
Yes. I have an auntie. I was named after my auntie who is also a teacher. And I think the family thinks naturally we are following the Razia kind of <laughs> uh, food, food, footsteps. Eh? Yes. So we are all teachers. So I, I do a lot of teaching. Even in my work uh, as a journalist, I do a lot of uh, mentoring. I do a lot of uh, training projects mm. at work. I do a lot of, um, I already mentioned uh, mentorship. I, lo- I do a lot of creating new things and learning new things. Right now we are doing uh, podcasts. I'm sure you've seen uh, some of my communications on my podcast. So podcasts are new, even to me. I'm learning. But also it's a new project at the company that I have this responsibility of teaching uh, the, 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 the podcasters at Vision Group, journalists who've never done podcasting. So I have to teach them. It's just something about me, I guess. I, I, I do a lot of training, a lot of teaching. Innovation. And my future, mm-hmm. my right. future looks like someone who's retired early but they still have one footing in the industry. They're still doing a little bit of work by teaching uh, teaching the future journalists. I think that's what my future looks like. I need to put myself in a position where I'm able to share all this knowledge. And I'm also able to learn uh, the new trends in journalism. Mm. And even if I may not practice, at least someone else should be able to practice it based on uh, what I teach. I, That's I, what my future looks like. And so, it should be near. I talk about retirement, but people think I'm crazy. So I believe in early retirement. <laughs> you, I believe you know, in retirement. I just don't know if it's possible in Uganda, I guess, with the economic situation. You but it. I, if I could retire even tomorrow, I would. You make it possible. You build blocks slowly by slowly and you can make it possible. Nobody needs to define for you. You define for yourself. So a young man, a young woman who is seated watching this and says, when I grow up, I want to be like Razia. What advice would you give that person? The, the, The way I ask this question most of the time is, what advice would you give yourself at 18 years of age? Mm-hmm. Stay true to yourself. True to yourself means understanding who you are, mm-hmm. what your values are, mm-hmm. what your journey looks like, because you decide your journey. Yeah. And just focusing on that journey and focusing on what will get you there without thinking of obstacles, without thinking of uh, the timing, without thinking of are the challenges. Just focus on the journey. I need to get here. Whether there are mountains, you know, you can go over that mountain. There are rivers. You could maybe swim across or, or build a bridge, but just focus on that journey and know where you're going. That's the advice I could give someone. Wonderful. So for young people, you hear, you hear, you heard it. Focus on the journey, put it in your mind. It is possible. I could make it, you can make it. And the mentorship aspect that was talked about is also available for you. All these mentors on this channel, you can comment, you can subscribe, you can follow, you can share, but also you have access now to them in their different aspects. Razia, before we conclude, you did talk about living in, in Kenya. You did talk about uh, <clears throat> speaking with Swahili accent. Would like our listeners to get the test of that Swahili. So as you conclude <laughs> and say bye-bye, please do say bye-bye to our listeners in Swahili. And uh, we thank you so much for making time in this holiday season. Our episode is featuring in the new year 2024. So you are our January part of this season. We concluded 2023 with all 52 episodes. And for everybody who made 2023 possible, who came as a guest, we thank you. In 2024, we will try to flip this and get you who've been our guests to actually host another guest 
using TJK uh, Shares channel so we can continue to learn, relearn, and unlearn together. We all know the best is yet to come, and thank you. You, Madam, in Swahili. Can I first, you wanted me to say something about um, the Israel-Hamas war, the oh, yes. September 11, and all these other security mm. challenges that we're dealing with in the country and uh, across the region in East Africa. And I just had a very, very short phrase uh, without getting into detail. I think oftentimes we judge religion by man instead of judging man by religion. Oh, that sounds like Jesus. Yeah, that's yeah. what I would love to say. And on that note, I want to say... Um, Mpenzi, mtazamaji, na kushukuru sana kwa kutizama hii uh, kipindi na Jackson Kagure. Uh, asante sana, asante sana kwa muda wako, uh, kwa heri na uh, siku kuu uh, njema na, uh, na, na kuitajia uh, mwaka mpya ya heri. <laughs> asante sana, <laughs> my sister. Karibu. <laughs> Thank you. Asante sana. Asante sana, Jackson. Mm. And we will not translate it for people. We would like people to go and if you can't understand, Google some of these words. At least you will Google and understand what Asante sana means. Thank yeah. you. Blessings. Inshallah, we will see each other soon, okay?